so sorry. I had it pulled up. One second, please. Okay. Perfect. All right. So after receiving her bachelor's in political science and international relations, Zainip um, Premda Siyulmaz moved to the United States to work for Procter and Gamble. And re oh, after retiring last year, she also enrolled in a program at Anadolu University in Turkey for cultural heritage. So previously in the past, she joined us for a discussion on Göbekli Tepe. And if you are not familiar with Göbekli Tepe, it's a fantastic, it was a fantastic Zoom, um, but I'm, I think we recorded it too, so it might be on our YouTube. But um, now she's joining us today to, to talk about um, Gilgamesh, the Epic of Gilgamesh. So Zainab, please take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Onur, for the introduction. And thanks to the Interfaith Center for hosting me again. And thanks everyone for joining, of course. But I would also like to thank three people, uh, Professor Kushat Demirji, Professor Ismail Gezgin, and Professor Andrew George. If it wouldn't be the uh, deep insights, knowledge, and passion for Gilgamesh, we wouldn't be making, I wouldn't be making this call <laughs> today. Um, I've heard of Gilgamesh, so let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, first and very quickly at the end there will be a discussion portion just a q a um if you guys want to put your questions in the chat i can moderate it and send them read them out to zainab so all righty yeah that would be great thank you okay i trust you can see my screen Right? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I've heard of Gilgamesh like anyone else who grew up in Turkey or Middle East. Um, it was a story of a king who was trying to find immortality. And when he couldn't, he was trying to find meaning for life. Um, but he was really fighting with the monsters and slaying the uh, bulls. Um, so it really didn't dawn on me until I attended these uh, online talks of Professor Demirji, how profound this story is. So I just honestly discovered it uh, last year and I'm on the third year of uh, his lectures. Hopefully the third year will start. Um, we're still in tablet number six, and there are 12 tablets. Um, so what is this story? The story is about human characteristics, human nature, ambitions, and at the end, transformation. And it's still relevant. I think that is why uh, we're still talking about this story 4,000 years later, right? Um, again, it's, it's about a king, a person, a human. And by the way, the name uh, Gilgamesh, and in original Sumerian, it's Bilgamesh, which means all-knowing, all-seeing individual. And you know who is all-seeing, all-knowing? Homo sapiens, right? So this story is actually the story of Homo sapiens. It's really uh, us or stories telling us who we are. And we love to put ourselves in the center of attention, right? We're like always in the center of the universe. So, and unfortunately that didn't change in 4,000 <clears throat> 4, years. So the story is about the humans looking for immortality and when they can't find their search for uh, the meaning of life. So what I'm gonna be doing uh, is really first, I wanna set the stage for you because I wanna tell you first where this story is taking place, what year, uh, what is the content, and then I'm gonna share some of the archeological evidence. And of course I will 
share the story itself, right? And after that, I'm going to kind of wrap, wrap it up and open it up for questions. So that's what I'm planning to do. Hope that's OK for everyone. So let me go ahead and uh, tell you uh, where this story is taking place. What you see here is uh, a map of uh, Mesopotamia. And Mesopotamia, by its meaning, is it, it means the land in between the two rivers. And those two rivers are Euphrates and the Tigris rivers. And uh, as you see, they uh, emerge from my country. I'm from Turkey. And they go all the way to Gulf or Persia, of Persia. And um, Mesopotamia is the land in between these two rivers. And it, the, the Fertile Crescent, is, why it is called the Fertile Crescent, going back all the way back to Ice Age, when all the, uh, or almost half of Europe covered in ice sheet, this was an area that uh, the life was flourishing. Actually, the, the living conditions was optimal. And that's why all the animals and all the humans flocked to this area uh, and they settled here. So it's not surprising to see the first civilizations emerging in, uh, in Mesopotamia. And you see our story is taking place in a town called Uruk in South Mesopotamia. And we're talking about Sumer, Sumerian uh, Empire here. And Uruk is not the first city. There is actually, if you see here, follow my uh, cursor, there is Jericho, which is 11,000 years old. There is Çatalhöyük in Turkey, uh, 8,000 BC. Uh, so the time range we're talking here is about uh, 5,000 BC, uh, when the Sumerian civilization started to uh, emerge in this area. So the significance of Uruk is that it is the first uh, human establishment. So it is the first city state uh, in another way. So that is really the significance. Um, so I keep saying 4,000 years, but this is when the story is written in tablets. Actually, uh, it is way older. People think this, it is way older. This story was being told uh, for maybe thousands of years. They captured it in writing, pretty much almost like after they discovered writing. And they did discover, the Sumerians discovered writing in uh, 3200 BC. And they did write this down um, probably around 1800s BCs. And just to give you another time frame, uh, the king we're talking here, uh, Gilgamesh, lived around 27th century BC. So this is everything we're talking is before Christ. Just, just so you know. Um, just another close up of uh, the Sumerian empire here, you see the other uh, cities. Ur is a very famous city. And Elam is today's Iran, uh, actually. So I mentioned that this story is captured in writing. And don't think that it is in paper or anything. It's in you know tablets in cuneiform. And uh, you see an example of one of these tablets. Well, uh, there are different versions of the story. So the first version, the in Sumerian, uh, actually there are five, uh, five tablets, five stories uh, in the old Sumerian. And then there are Babylonian versions. There is the old Babylon Babylonian, middle Babylonian. What we're going to be talking about today is the standard Babylonian. So uh, after thousands of years telling or hearing this story, uh, they finally gathered the whole aspects of the story into 12 uh, tablets. And that's what we, were, we will be talking about today. So these tablets, uh, probably the biggest uh, discovery was uh, 1853 in today's Iraq in Nineveh, which is today's Mosul. Uh, archaeologists 
found a library. So this is the library of the king Asur Banipal. And they found uh, these tablets, uh, hundreds, maybe thousands of them uh, in, this, in this library. And uh, some tablets are in different museums. Sometimes they bring these pieces together. You see this piece uh, is separate. Sometimes it happens that one piece is in one museum, another piece is another. So they get together, kiss each other briefly, and then separate again. And you see sometimes part of the tablet is missing. And so what happens is because this story was so widespread, known in this area, there are other tablets that they find with the missing pieces of the story. So that's how they bring up the standard version by bringing pieces literally together and making up, making up the story. Um, there are few things that I want to take your attention before we get into the story, because we really need to put ourselves into their shoes to understand some of the concepts. Uh, what you see here is a temple. This is a temple of Anu, and Anu is the main god in Sumerian religion. Um, you can think of him as like a counterpart of Zeus in Greek mythology. And this is a temple uh, in Uruk uh, dedicated to god Anu. Uh, it's also called the White Temple. Uh, the story, Gilgamesh, starts with talking about the city walls. The story starts with the city walls and also ends describing the city walls. And right now we might say, oh, well, you know, what is the big deal about city walls, right? But for them, that means a lot. That's all about, you know, protection and security, especially if you think that Gilgamesh was the first king uh, who, who built these city walls uh, and that all his people were feeling safe and secure. It was such an important thing that they really wanted to uh, start this uh, story describing their city walls. This is something that they feel very proud. So that's what I wanted to share. There are also other concepts uh, in the story that we might like raise our eyebrows today, like there is a, uh, a concubine or a temple prostitute uh, somewhere in the story. And you might think, oh, okay, what is, uh, what is this? Like a temple prostitute, but this is um, a, a kind of, actually these are nuns. Uh, and this is like a sacred uh, role that they play these nuns embody the goddess and they have intercourse with people but the purpose of this is really to bring fertility to the land so uh, and it's a sacred position uh, actually so again it's it's different than today <laughs> but just keep that in mind when you when you listen when you listen the story um, so I'm gonna really share uh, some of the archaeological evidence so you can uh, first of all meet our uh, handsome, young, strong hero Gilgamesh here depicted in this uh, in this picture. I'm gonna share just a few. So this is uh, I believe this is his uh, friend, companion Enkidu in this one. So this is the monster, Humbaba, and another depiction of Humbaba. This is a very fierce monster, by the way. And these are pictures of uh, Enkidu and Gilgamesh killing Humbaba, the monster. Here's again the two. Uh, killing the bull of heaven, and another one. I think this is again uh, a Gilgamesh killing, killing the uh, bull of heaven. So I'm gonna stop sharing uh, for a second and tell you the story. And then uh, I can 
go back to the slides at the end of the uh, end of the presentation. Uh, you see me on the screen on the right. It's working. I put it on the uh, speaker uh, screen. All right, great, excellent. Are, um, are you talking about the slides or? Yeah, uh, no, I'm not sharing any slides right now. It's on uh, speaker view. Okay, yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, so the story is about, again, Gilgamesh. He is a king, right? Um, and he, his father was a king and his mother is a goddess. So he is two third human, one third uh, God. So he's a demigod. But he is not immortal. He's immortal at the end. And he's a very strong, uh, very powerful God, but he has some shortcomings and sometimes he abuses his power. And uh, one shortcoming he has is he wants to be with the brides first in their wedding nights. And this really creates some disturbance among his people. Uh, and it the text this is described at such level that uh, mothers were shy away from people and daughters uh, refrained from marriage, but they were scared. They were scared to confront him because he's such a uh, powerful personality. So what they do, they go up to the gods, right? And they go and cry out to the gods that gods please deliver us from him. So the guy, gods here, their plea and they decide that something needs to be done and they decide to create a rival for Gilgamesh. So the goddess of the birth grabs a handful of uh, mud and shapes it and throws it out to the thick of the forest and here comes uh, Enkidu. And Enkidu is a uh, animal-like uh, person. He is covered with thick hair um, and he is really uh, hunting with the animals, eating with the animals. He's using the same watering hole with the animals. He is really animal-like and he's very, very strong. Uh, so uh, one day a hunter notices that his traps are being destroyed and destroyed in a way that an animal cannot do it. So he decides to hide and wait. Who is destroying his traps? And when he sees Enkidu, he's really frightened. Uh, he goes back, rushing back to the city, and he tells his father what he has seen. And his father says, well, we've been expecting a godsend uh, rival to, to Gilgamesh, so this might be it. So he advises him to go tell this to Gilgamesh. So the hunter goes to Gilgamesh, uh, to, Gilgamesh to the king, and uh, describes what he has seen exaggeratedly so, and asks him to give one of his beautiful concubines uh, along to go along to uh, fetch this animal-like uh, creature. And Gilgamesh, uh, hearing this, agrees to give one of his concubines and the woman and the hunter uh, sets on their way. They go to the forest and they hide and uh, wait for Enkidu and the animals to come. And they do, they come to the watering hole and the hunter throws the concubine into the open uh, and Enkidu, seeing a woman for the first time, starts making love with her. And this goes on for like six nights and seven days. And finally, uh, the woman prepares a meal for him. Uh, she cleans him out and uh, gives him the clothes that she had brought. She massages him with oils and perfumes. So they set uh, up for a nice dinner. Uh, so basically, she teaches them how to behave, how to be a man. And after, after dinner, Enkudu wants to go back and join his animal friends, but they don't recognize him anymore. And he can't communicate with them anymore. So he lost his uh, connection to nature. So without having any other choice, he comes back to the concubine and 
she tells all about the how beautiful the city of Uruk, how beautiful the walls. So she tries to convince him to come with him to the city. And without uh, what, what else he can do, he just follows uh, the woman back to the city. And when they come to the city, they see a commotion. People are shouting, crying, and Enkidu asks someone, well, what is, what is going on? What is happening? And apparently there is another wedding and uh, Bilgamu showed up, wants to be with the bride and the family is objecting. And he says, well, wait a second, I'm here. I can't let this happen anymore. What is it? Is this a jungle? And he starts a fight with Gilgamesh. So the, the two fights for hours and they cannot win, neither of them. And Enkud is about to pin him down and they come eye to eye and a mutual love and respect grows in both men. And Gilgamesh realizes that this is really his, his uh, friend, his brother uh, who has been sent by the gods. And uh, or and some into according to some accounts actually they're lovers too so uh but when the two get together actually Gukavish uh becomes even more arrogant he wants to do better things he wants to set his mark on earth so he decides to kill Kumbaba who is the monster who lives in the cedar forest who is the guardian of the forest well, everybody tries to persuade him not to do not to do this task because it is very dangerous. Uh, nobody has survived ever encountering this monster. Uh, his breath alone is like fire. But of course, uh, they cannot stop him. And Gilgamesh and Enkidu starts their journey uh, to find and kill Humbaba. And finally, they go to the cedar forest. Uh, Humbaba first hears about the intruders, but he doesn't really care at first. So how to take his, they, his attention? They start chopping down the trees. Because he is the guardian of the forest, he comes up and they start a fight. And at some point, actually, Gilgamesh feels for him because he starts pleading for his life. Uh, he, he will always, almost going to let him go. But Enkidu says, no, my friend, we really need to kill him. If we don't kill him, he will kill us. So anyway, the two kill the monster. And it, it, as this happens, uh, the gods are watching them from above. And one of the goddesses, Inanna, and she is the daughter of Anu. And she's a very strong figure in Sumerian religion. Uh, she falls in love with Gilgamesh. She's in awe with uh, his power and strength and appears before him. And she says, I really like you and I want to marry you. And Gilgamesh, with all due respect, refuses her because he knows what she has done her husband's or uh, companions. She has a track history actually uh, to destroying in one way or another. Actually, she even trapped her own husband in underworld. So the Gilgamesh says, well, I'm so sorry, but I'm not giving my life for you. And of course, Inanna cannot take this as an answer. She is filled with rage and anger. She goes up to her father, Anu, and other gods congregated. And she says she's, she's very upset. And she's, she asks for the bull uh, of heavens to be deployed to kill Gilgamesh. Well, the gods try to convince him not to do this because this bull is the husband of the uh, goddess who is the underworld goddess and also Inanna's sister. So if something happens, that could really uh, jeopardize the life on earth. But she doesn't listen and they have to give the bull to her. And the two, our duo, Gilgamesh and Enkudu, starts fighting the bull but they kill him. So the goddess of the underworld gets really upset because they killed her husband and goes and threatens the gods to really unleash all the zombies to the earth. So the gods congregate again, not knowing what to do, they decide to kill one of them, either Gilgamesh or Enkidu. And they decide to kill Enkidu. And as this happens, 
somehow Enkidu is watching this as it happens like a live stream, right? And he goes to uh, Gilgamesh, wakes him up and says, well, the gods decided to kill me. And Gilgamesh draws his sword and says, well, don't worry, my friend. Um, nobody can do it, do anything for you, uh, to you. I'm here for you. But Enkidu falls ill and gets bedridden and he passes away in seven days. So just seeing that for the first time impacts Gilgamesh a lot. Seeing his best friend, this strong guy taken ill and die, um, now he starts to be scared that the same thing would happen to him. First, he doesn't wanna even give his body away. Uh, he wants to keep him to himself, but as he watched the body decay and decompose, finally, uh, he gives up the body for a funeral. And, uh, but after that, it really sinks in that this, this might happen to him. So he got scared and he tries to find a solution to immortality. So he starts asking around to all the wise people, all the sages and oracles, um, if there is any way, if there is any immortal, uh, who gained immortality. Um, and they say, yes, actually there is one person who got immortality. His name is Utnapishtim. Uh, so they direct Gilgamesh to find, and he goes through many adventures. Uh, first to the land of the scorpion man, the scorpion king sends him to uh, an oracle called Siduri and Gugamush uh, travels day and night. And at some point he travels actually in utter darkness without having any light, but he continues going on. And finally he gets to uh, what this oracle told him, the, the shore and beyond the shore, there is the uh, sea of death. And this immortal man, lives beyond that sea. And there is a ferryman who can take him, but of course he refuses to because he wasn't supposed to take anybody there. And uh, Gilgamesh starts a fight with him. Uh, and actually he breaks his sail. Uh, and hearing his story, the, the, the ferryman feels for him and uh, asks him to cut 120 poles and they start sailing finally and their poles keeps breaking. And finally, when they reach to the land, almost reach, about to reach to the land, Gilgamesh himself acts like the pole and they finally get uh, to the land. And there, Utnapishtim and his wife are watching in all what is happening and the ferryman is coming and there is somebody that he's bringing, he wasn't supposed to. Uh, so when Gilgamesh comes to land, uh, they ask who he is, and he tells them his story that he is looking for immortality and that he has heard that uh, Utnapishtim had immortality, so he wants to say. And Utnapishtim says, well, there may be a chance if you resist slumber. And Gugami says, of course, no problem. And he's been traveling for so long, he fell asleep right away. And uh, Utnapishtim says, uh, well, he won't believe us if we tell him that he was sleeping. So he ask, asks his wife to bake a bread every day that Gilgamesh was sleeping. And finally, seventh day, they poke him and wake him up. And Gilgamesh says, oh, I'm so glad you poked me. I was almost going to go to sleep. Um, and they say, well, you were sleeping already for seven days. And they show him the breads and the bread from uh, seven days ago, stale already. And Gugamish is very upset, thinks he maybe lost his one chance. But also he's curious. So he asks Utnapishtim, how did you happen to get immortality? So he tells him his story that he was a king once. And um, at that time, the world was really populated with a lot of humans and they grow disrespectful to gods and gods decided to terminate humanity. But one of the gods, 
Enki, who is the god of wisdom, came to Utnapishtim because Utnapishtim was always worshiping him. And he asked Utnapishtim to build an ark and he gave him the dimensions and he asked him to gather uh, a, a pair, a couple from each animals and also asked him to gather seeds from the plants and take his family and lock the doors of the ark and wait. So Utnapishtim starts building the ark, ridiculed by people because there is not even water around. But as soon as he gathers all the animals and the plants and locks the doors, the rain starts. Rain starts and it turns to a big storm and then a flood. And actually the whole world is submerged in water. And for 40 days and 40 nights, uh, it keeps raining. And uh, he sends out a raven, he comes back, sends out uh, a pigeon, it comes back, and finally he sends out a doll, and it doesn't come back. So Utnapishtim realizes that actually the doll found somewhere to land, so the waters must be receding. And they finally uh, anchor in the mouth of Nisir. And he opens the door and all the animals spread to the world again. They repopulate. Um, and, uh, and by the way, the gods are watching and they're not pleased with what they did to humanity. So they feel guilty as well. And they don't know what to do with Utnapishtim. So they decide to give him immortality. And once Gilgamesh hears this story, he even feels more desperate. He realizes he will never get immortality. So he starts uh, almost uh, his journey back home, but good, uh, Utnapishtim's wife, out of her compassion, wants to give him a gift. So uh, Utnapishtim says, well, there is actually a plant. This is the plant for youthfulness. So you cannot get immortality, but at least we will look young. Uh, so our uh, Gugamish, Again, ferryman takes him to deep sea and uh, to find this plant with apparently growing under the, under the sea at uh, the deep sea. He takes some stones and with the help of the stones, he dives uh, and finds this thorny plant and the plant rips his hands, but he doesn't care. He gets the plant finally, puts it in, his, in its uh, leather bag and uh, uh, leaves the ferryman. And by the way, Utnapishtim uh, dismisses the ferryman because he took someone uh, who wasn't supposed to, he, he wasn't supposed to bring. But uh, Gilgamesh, you know, on his way to get home, he walks for days and months. And finally, he gets to a lake uh, and uh, he wants to unwind a little bit, take a bath. He leaves his leather bag on the shore. And when he was uh, taking a bath, he notices a wriggling and he notices a uh, snake with the uh, plant of youthfulness in his jaw disappearing into the, into the water. So he lost that one last uh, gift as well, the youthfulness. So finally, uh, he gets back home and he gathers uh, all his scribers uh, to capture the story because he realizes how uh, profound this adventure was and he doesn't want to be uh, forgotten and he asks his people to capture this in tablets and that's that's really what happens. So uh, let me go ahead and share my screen again. And let's continue uh, with some more details of the story. So first the archetypes, right? Uh, and this is really so exciting because these are the prototype archetypes if there is such a word. Uh, but imagine this is the first literary piece written in, in tablets, right? So this is the first story ever. And the archetypes here in this story actually continues to this day. So there is the hero, of course, uh, Gilgamesh is one. Uh, his friend and companion, 
And if you notice stories, there's always a hero and a companion and a friend next to him. Uh, it's Enkidu in this story. Uh, the mentor is Utnapishtim, telling him, um, actually giving him some advice about the meaning of life. There are also some concepts uh, discussed in this story, first time ever, like the concepts of heaven and hell, light and darkness. As you know, uh, he walks in utter darkness for a long time to reach to the uh, death, uh, sea of death. And the story talks about civilization and wilderness. And again, they must be really proud of their civilization uh, because they talk a lot about this, in, especially in the beginning of the story. So what are some signs of being civilized? So we see that um, having fine clothes, eating, uh, dining, uh, grooming are, uh, are all signs of, uh, of civilization. Also uh, other than food, the oils and perfumes, um, and also, uh, and of course, in this story, civilization is depicted by Gilgamesh and wilderness, his friend Enkidu, right? He was a wild man. Um, it, there is also discussion of arrogance and humbleness, because Gilgamesh, at first, he was a very arrogant, strong personality, but having gone through this journey, uh, he comes back as a humble, humble person. He learns acceptance and surrender, right? There are also some metaphors like love destroys utter power. And we might add that it takes a woman to make a man <laughs> civilized. So uh, there is a section of the story that talks about uh, it is transformation. Again, this is really important in the story and it, it describes it like this. He explored everywhere the seats of power and learned of everything, the sum of wisdom. He saw what was secret, discovered what was hidden. He brought back a tale of before the deluge. He came a far road, was weary, found peace, all his labors were set in a tablet of stone. So you clearly see that uh, surrendering uh, and here and, and the peace that he found because he realized that he cannot get immortality, but he found peace coming back home. Um, this is probably my favorite part of the story. So somewhere along the story, and I didn't share all of it, of course, it's, uh, it's really long, but he meets a fish. And again, the fish asks him what he's doing and he tells him his story. And the fish gives him an advice. And this is what he says, make merry each day. They dance and play day and night. Let your clothes be clean. Let your head be washed. May you bathe in water. Gaze on the little one who holds your hand. Let a woman enjoy your repeated embrace, for such is the destiny of the mortal man. I really think this really describes it the best. And uh, for me, it is, it is the core of the story, right? Uh, you cannot find immortality. You really need to be pleased with what you have, and it is so simple. So I, I mentioned about the walls of uh, the city and that the story starts with this and then um, ends with the same thing, with the same description. So it goes like this, climb Uruk's wall and walk back and forth. Survey its foundation, examine the brickwork, so see how proud they are. Were its bricks not fired in an oven? Did the seven sages not laid its foundations? A square mile is city, a square mile did it grow, a square mile is clay pit, half a square mile the temple of Ishtar, three square miles and a half, 
Uruk's expense. So here really it gives the dimensions of the city. So this is really how the story ends. This is, this is the very, very last part of the story. And it's very, you think it's an abrupt ending, right? So Gilgamesh comes back, climbs to the Uruk walls, and he looks out to the city. And this is what he sees. He sees the city, the date grow, clay pit, the temple. So this is how um, one of the ultimate experts in this story, Andrew George explains. A city, uh, when he climbs to the city walls, he sees all the houses, right? This is really, the life is going on. It is procreated every, every moment. You see, the date grow, it is really the food. They are growing their own food. It's the food production. Uh, they're manufacturing. Well, at that time, it was really clays. They didn't have many technology. That was, it was very important to have the clay pits and uh, they used it for uh, their, uh, to hold the foods, the clay uh, pots and the tablets and the temple representing their spiritual life. So actually what is fascinating is what they had 4,000 years ago, we still have the same, right? So we live in nice cities. We share our food with our loved ones, our families. Uh, we have some really great breakthrough manufacturing facilities. And we have temples, we have spiritual uh, depth, especially in Midwest. I love, you know, in Cincinnati, how deep of a city it is. So it is very similar actually, right? So the story is telling us really not to look out more, but just enjoy what we have, it's right here. It is community, it is food, it is doing our work right. And it is our spiritual life, our belief, uh, faith. So I'll just uh, leave you with this again, my favorite part, the advice of the fish, make merry each day. Dance and play day and night. Let your clothes be clean. Let your head be washed. May you bathe in water. Gaze on the little one who holds your hand. Let everyone enjoy your repeated embrace, for such is the destiny of the mortal man. Still applicable today, right? So that's, that's really the story. So wow. let's go back, <laughs> open up for any questions. Yeah, um, I have a very quick question. So does the Sumerian empire predate like ancient Greece, right? Oh yeah. Okay, because I also have more questions now. So <laughs> I saw a lot of symbolism and like not symbolism, but um, similar stories across like cultures and timelines. So like I saw, um, similarities between like the stories of Troy and the Trojan War and then um with like um Enkidu and um Gilgamesh and I thought that was very interesting especially the mentions of the walls too I thought that was kind of cool and then um especially with the Ark with uh Christianity and like all the Abrahamic religions as well just I don't know it's I in my mind that kind of means that um it would have happened way before whenever the story is in the bible or the quran or the torah or like the the old testament would have been recorded so that kind of I think it's cool to see like the timeline and perspective of just I guess history in a sense predating everything um even like even silly things too, like Dr. Seuss, I don't know, with like the trees and cutting down trees. Um, I thought that was kind of interesting, but 
Yeah, um, that's really cool. I guess that wasn't really questions, but that was more just me gawking about how cool it is. But so those yeah, are thank great you. points. Thanks mm -hmm. for sharing, one. But you are absolutely right. That's mm -hmm. why I said, you know, this is almost like the prototype of all the archetypes, of all the stories, of all the stories that we know. Right. Um, kind of summarize it. It feels like everything spurred from this one story to me, at least. Uh, that's why it is fascinating. But you are right. Uh, absolutely, the flood story. Right. I thought was in our uh, religious books. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, dates back much, much uh, right. before. Probably, uh, probably there was a flood. I think this is uh, in our uh, collective memory, right? Mm -hmm. Collective consciousness. Right. I really think that happened. Uh, mm -hmm. it has been carried out and uh, captured right. here, uh, as well as all the uh, religious books. And it's not even in religious books too. Like I, when I was a kid, I loved it, like Greek mythology, and it's even in Greek mythology as well. Like the story, if anyone is familiar, the story of um, Deucalion and Pyrrha. So it's basically the same thing. The gods got angry; they flooded the earth, and in the end, I think Hermes comes down and says cast like the bones of the earth behind your shoulders and they understand it's like oh you have to throw the rocks behind you and then that's how the new people are created so it, it's all over it's not even just that it's also like native american stories it's everywhere like to the mayans it's it's, it's crazy mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. yeah yeah right, i'll stop talking now but <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Barbara, any other yes. questions? Oh, I think you're muted, Barbara. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of timeline, Gilgamesh, I just I had looked it up, uh, was put together as it was in pieces before, is what I'm reading, um, starting around 2400 BCE and came together as a single document about 1200 BCE. And I'm thinking that maybe the story wasn't very well known until the whole thing was put together at 1200 BCE, which would be fine for, I'm, to me, there's no question, I mean, the 40 days, 40 nights, the ark, the two, you know, two of each species, the wording is actually in some places the same as uh, um, in Exodus, I mean, in Genesis. Um, and so I'm thinking that much of this was written down I think about that time, uh, I, my understanding um, history-wise is that if we, if the Jews were really, the, their contact with the Greeks, I mean, with the Egyptians was along the, the coastal trade route and they were slaves working uh, in the various fortresses and, and, and settlements and they, re, and as the sea people came in, so they conquered the Greeks and pushed them down. And the final rebellion was about uh, about twelve, someplace around twelve hundred, or maybe eleven hundred BCE, and that fits perfectly with the, with the writing of the whole story together because I don't think anything was written before then. Right. And uh, Barbara, you're right. Uh, it was all put together. It used to be in different pieces before. Like I said, there were five, five of the original stories come from the Sumerian tablets, five tablets, but others from different uh, Babylonian versions. But they kind of and of course, we don't know if it was, we don't, they don't think it was one person. It should be a collection of authors brought this or wrote this together, wrote this together. Yeah. Uh, but, but, uh, so if that was around 1200, I, 
by that 1200, it depends on how, I guess, close they were to Egyptians in term, terms of having parchment. Were these, was it put together on tablets or on parchment? Well, this was on tablets. I mean, not parchment, but, but whatever. Yeah, this was on tablets. This was on tablets and was uh, most of it found in this one library in Nineveh. It, say it, what's the name again once more? N-I-N-E-V-E-H. Nineveh? Oh. Yeah. Well, that answers that question. Okay. Yeah. yeah. In our current day Mosul in Iraq. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And uh, let me, actually, it's right here. So you might be interested in this book. This is called What Happened? Uh, 1117 BC, the year of the year civilization collapsed by Eric Klein. Uh, he is a he is a professor. Eric Klein. Okay. Yep. Uh, what I would also suggest um, there is a very good YouTube uh, lecture by Andrew George, who is the expert in Gilgamesh. It is only like an hour, hour and a half. Uh, I would recommend that if you're you want to hear more about it, you want to really see. I, th I think you. You told me what I really wanted to hear, you know, what a, what what was most meaningful to me. Yes. But I had no idea the step was that close to the flood story. I mean, all the, I mean, the details, the sending out, the repeated sending out. Amazing. Yeah, fascinating. It cannot be by chance. Um, Zainab, I actually have another question. So when you were mentioning um, the god Anu, I I love Greek mythology, like any type of mythology, to be honest. And I noticed a similarity in the name between Anubis and Anu. And I know Anubis has a very major part in Egyptian mythology as like the caretaker of the underworld type of thing. And I I don't know if that kind of like translated. I don't know if you can answer that question, but do you know if that like kind of transferred like the name or at least the importance at all? Yeah, I honestly, I don't know. Okay. Uh, I don't know that, but I've read a couple articles that compare Sumerian uh, mythology to Greek because mm -hmm. these concepts of uh, gods and goddesses transformed their names transformed and they transformed from greek to romans actually mm -hmm. it's the same what's important right. is the qualities of these gods right mm -hmm. uh and it might there might be different names but the qualities stay the same and transform right. from culture to culture so it might well be the same thing with mm -hmm. uh, anubis i also saw like another um similarity um with pandora's box and Ankidu. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with that, but it was the gods were angry at um, Prometheus and his brother for um, sent like sharing the secrets of fire with man. So they sent him like Zeus and all the other gods sent Prometheus and his cousin a box. And it was also they came what came with it was a young lady who was. Um, um, oh, my God, I just said it before. Uh, um, the name of the myth I was just saying, it kind of just slipped my mind. No, no, no. Um, uh, oh my God, I was just talking about it. Oh, Pandora, Pandora, Pandora. sorry. Right, they right. send down Pandora. And what ends up happening is she gets too curious and she opens the box. And inside the box is like um, guilt and pain and suffering and all these horrible things that ends up plaguing humanity for like eternity but not that extensively but it was i felt it was kind of similar in a sense and then obviously it was better at the end but so that's pandora's box yes okay any other questions if you're shy please feel free to type in the chat and i will read them out or just speak up either is okay
Okay. Well, I'm not here. Oh, Usha, I think. I, I don't know if you were trying to speak before, but I think you might be muted if you were. Can you Hi, my name me? is Bala. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Oh, you, yes. you can go first, sir. Okay. So I just want to make a comment. So, mm -hmm. you know, when we talk about mythology, which goes back 5,000 or 10,000 years or whatever, um, my thoughts go back to the early migration of humans out of Africa, which was 70, 80,000 years ago. Right. At least that's what science tells us. And these are the same people who spread all over the world. And um, although they are separated by tens of thousands of years, the original connection still remains. You can see that in mythology, like, just like you said, when you say some of these mythology that you hear are similar or connected, I, I just feel that the connection goes even way back because the human migration that started from Africa and spread all over the world, people carried with them a same kind of uh, intuition or stories and you see those kinds of links between say Hindu mythology, Greek mythology, Sumerian, you pick any one of them and you will see sort of links here and there. And I just feel that uh, it goes even further back. That, that's the reason yeah. why we see all of these things connected. Mm -hmm. That That is yeah. my comment. Yeah, that you're absolutely right. Like, to be honest, like I kind of overlooked that you're honest and but you're absolutely right there in a sense that we all kind of did stem from the same place. And of course, like we would carry these stories with us. And that's, that does explain why there's a lot of the same stories. You're right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think Kaylee, you also had a quick comment to make. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, thank you to everybody. I actually am driving right now, so I've been like listening in through um, my speaker, but I'm the new program director and owner and Zen did a wonderful job with this event. I'm so thankful for um, all the hard work you guys put into this. And I did want to mention too, if you guys like this kind of discussion where you are looking at how there's like an interconnectedness between many different religions, we are going to have more similar um, kinds of discussions with future events. But the one that we currently have already on the schedule is for December, and it's looking at some of like the pagan origins of Christmas celebrations. Um, and so like we discussed here with the Ark story originating with um, like Sumerian culture, um, we're going to look at some of the pagan roots for Christmas celebrations as well. But there will be some future ones, and I know Owner and I are going to work on something in regards to like the Ark um story at some point specifically um so just keep an eye out for that but we're really excited for all of the events we have coming up here soon and i hope you guys enjoy this evening yeah thank you kaylee and be sure to look out for our events and also events from our other intern who's also joining us today emma Pekar. um she's also helping me co-host and moderate the room while the whole event was going on um very quickly before we end i did get a few more questions so if we have time I'll just read out those if that's okay, Zainab. Sure. All right. I won't try to make it too long, but we'll see. Okay. So I'll just read it out from, actually, um, Emma directed it to me from someone, but it says one, prof one, of, one of the prophets, Zarathustra or Zoroaster teachings over 5,000 year ago, years ago was con Contentment is the greatest virtue, and then it continues, Prophet Zarustra is believed to have lived in eastern part of the Persian Empire, and his teachings were the majority religion of the empire for over a thousand years after Cyrus the Great established this empire. 
And then thousands of tablets were also found describing the life, economy, salaries of the Persian Empire that are being studied and documented at a university in USA. And then they said, I think, in University of Illinois. Um, and I think that was also from, I'm, I'm not really sure how to pronounce the name, but um, thank you so much for sharing that with us. That was a, a really good um, note, actually. Um, I, oh, I always hear about Zoroastrianism and it's kind of, it, it was a major religion for a while, but it's, it's always on underlooked, I feel like, but thank you so much. Um, but yes, if you have any other questions, feel free to email us at the Interfaith Center email, and I'll be sure to email it, forward it to Zainip, and I can forward it back as well. But for now, I think we're going to cut it off here. Uh, thank you again so much, Zainip, for sharing this fantastic meeting with us. And yeah. <laughs> this presentation so nice. is wonderful. Really, really good. I'm happy to hear it. Thank you, Zainab, for sharing this with us. Yeah, thanks for thanks everyone for attending and all the uh, questions and comments. I really appreciate that. And thank you for your continued efforts to uh, bring all these different traditions together and uh, allowing us to see this interconnectedness, right? Mm -hmm. I think what we need to see a lot more. So thank you. Really appreciate all the work you do at Interfaith Center. Oh, it's our pleasure. All of our interns are very dedicated to this topic. So be sure to look out for events created by myself, Emma, Emma Pekar again, and of course, our new director, Kaylee Rains. So don't fear, we're always here. Okay. All right. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.